Um, we'll stick to a loose agenda, Jim, if that's okay, and then we can see where it takes us. But um, just just by way of introduction, I maybe spend a couple of minutes just introducing you, and you can chip in as well. Um, I think we met in 2014 in London uh, when you were doing one of these investment seminars. Yes. And uh, actually, um, you. Uh, oh, there's, sorry. There's, sorry, I'll just stop Jim's video there. Um, if I'm right in saying you were happily that coincided with the Ryder Cup at Glen Eagles, so you were you were off to watch that. Which, I was, yeah. yeah. So, I wasn't um, uh, as pleased with the results as maybe you were, but uh, it was a fun time anyway. <laughs> yeah, we were supporting the wrong team. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was the start of a, a beautiful friendship, and yes. uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed our chats over the over the years. And then um, I think for the purposes of today, it was really just a chance to have a chat with you and hear a bit about Aristotle and really your views on the market and what sure. was going on. Um, if I'm right in saying you you guys run about two billion pounds worth of investments for St. James's Place? It's two, I looked this morning, it's 2.3 billion. Yeah. Uh, well, we just rounded to 2.5. Okay. <laughs> um, and it's the North American fund that you guys look after. Right. So specifically focused in North American equities. Um, but there's a lot of correlation between what you do, investment processes and analysis and so on, as to what all the fund managers do that are associated to St. James's Place. So it, it's relevant to have discussions about how that process works and so on as well. So I, I would be interested just to have a chat about that relationship. But I mean, the, the, the big thing, obviously is what's going on right now in the crisis and and what's happened and what's going to happen in the future and how we manage that if that's fair sure that, um, that was that was a lot of questions there in the last uh, 30 yeah, well, seconds so back. <laughs> where would you like to start yeah well the other thing is uh, for anyone that's that's listening in there is a question and answer button um i um i will um people can chip in and and uh, and ask questions as well and we'll try and answer them if if, if we can if that's all right um, but i'm guessing we'll take about 40 minutes um today and um we'll, we'll follow up with clients if if there is anything that's kind of left un, unsaid or whatever um so yeah I, I thought we would start jim just actually hearing a bit about aristotle and how you guys operate and then the interaction with, with St. James's Place. Sure. Um, so the, the relationship uh, between um, Aristotle Capital Management and St. James's Place um, actually goes back to uh, 2004 um, at our predecessor firm, uh, Reed Connor Birdwell. We had a merger um, uh, that took place in 2011. Um, and we've been managing, as I said, the, the North American Fund that goes back to 2004. So the continuity of it and the investment people, um, many are the same that stretch back into those days, myself included. I've been involved in, in, uh, in managing this portfolio since its inception. Um, the, the relationship that we have with, uh, with SJP is really twofold. It's it's not just with SJP, but it's also with the investment consultant Stanford Associates that um, oversees uh, uh, multiple uh, fund managers that are on the platform. And and you mentioned Ali that there, that there seems to be um, some similarities among the fund managers, regardless of what their discipline is or what asset class that they're operating in. And, and that's not um, happenstance, that's, that's by design. There's an overarching kind of philosophy, investment philosophy that seems to be ingrained into SJP and in, in through Stanford Associates um, that uh, they tend to gravitate towards fund managers that are focusing on very high quality businesses, companies that um, have some sort of a competitive advantage in the space that they're operating in um, that will allow them to be successful 
um, regardless of the market environment. Market environments come and go. And we'll talk a lot about the current market environment where we see it going um, forward. Um, but the, the overriding factor that's going to deter determine um, whether a company's stock price does well um, or a market in general does well is the underlying fundamentals of the individual businesses that make up that market or that are inherent in an individual business. So if, you, if one focuses their time um, understanding uh, the prospects for the individual businesses and less time worrying about the, what we call the noise, you know, kind of the news of the day. And we were joking earlier and some may have been on, but, um, you know, talking about how that, that noise may create short-term volatility and give us some breathtaking up days and some breathtaking down days. But over the long run, it's going to be those individual businesses that are going to drive the market. So okay. I mentioned I mentioned volatility. Let me just say one thing, and we can talk about performance uh, more later on. Um, but given everything that we've been through in the last twelve months, okay, from the a great economy that in the U.S. Uh, that was manifesting itself in strong market returns mid last year, late last year, and then everything changed come February. If you've been invested in the North American fund over the last 12 months, um, your returns are just shy of up 2%. So as much as it's been a difficult year so far, um, if you look over a 12 month period, um, you, you actually have positive returns. And then if you annualize over three and five years, you have significantly positive returns. So it really is the prospect of, you know, if you're gonna invest and, and invest in equity securities, if your time horizon is three to five years, you're probably gonna do pretty well. Yeah. I mean, that, that's probably one of the amazing things about the North American fund has been one of the best performing funds consistently. Um, and if you read the papers, particularly the British press, they, they love a negative story. Of uh, course, <laughs> those papers. <laughs> yeah, how, 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 uh, probably jumping ahead a little bit, but how do you see through those headlines? You know, today we've had Royal Mail are gonna make 2000 people redundant. Um, and, and so for the man in the street, that's quite a shocking figure to read, you know, that Royal Mail's have, a, a sort of bastion of 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 the UK is is one of the major firms, so it's quite a shock to everyone. Um, yeah. How do you see beyond that? Well, there there are some um, some very uh, long term important trends that we as an investment team um, have been studying for some time, uh, and there are certainly economic <clears throat> disconnects that are looming. Mm -hmm. um, there are changes that are taking place, uh, not just in the, in the economy in the U.S., but globally. Some of them are positive and some of them are negative. So if you look, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, on, on the negative side, um, you've seen uh, movie theater attendance in the States uh, on a long-term decline. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't didn't just happen when the pandemic started. It's been going on for a, a long period of time, as we've seen content being aired elsewhere. So the number of people actually going to movie theaters is in decline. Now, right now, the number of people going to movie theaters is zero, right? Because they're all closed down. But um, that long-term trend that we have identified of content being aired other places other than in moving movie theaters is being accelerated by the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? So it's something that's been happening anyway, but it's being accelerated and will never be the same. Yep. Then on the positive side for companies like Zoom that we're operating in now, or one of our investments, Microsoft Teams, um, these, these business tools were not invented in January. They've been around for, um, for some period of time, but because we've all been asked to work from home, um, to shelter in place, uh, to be able to uh, 
conduct our day-to-day -day activities, these types of business um, tools, uh, their, their usage has skyrocketed, right? Now, this was a long-term trend that was going on before the pandemic. Microsoft Teams and Zoom was being utilized, less business travel, which will affect the airlines for a long period of time yeah. um, in, in a negative way. Uh, these things have been there, but this pandemic has accelerated their adoption, okay? The same thing with PayPal, one of our holdings in the portfolio. Contactless um, transactions, PayPal saw their largest quarter ever last quarter. So there are some, some beneficiaries of these long-term trends um, that uh, are, will, will be that way for a long period of time to come. And then there will be some negative ones that will be that way for a long period of time to come. But then there are some transitory um, um, uh, issues that this pandemic has caused um, that uh, will cause some businesses and some of them, frankly, that we own um, that will see uh, a tough go of it for the next couple of quarters. So we own a home builder in the portfolio called Lennar. Um, I don't suspect over the next couple of quarters that Lennar is going to sell any homes. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's going to be difficult for them. There's no question about that. Um, but the overriding dynamics of the, the home building market in the States remains unchanged. Homes continue to wear out. They become obsolete. You have population growth where you need you know, more and more housing stock. You can only um, uh, build at a below trend line uh, replacement housing stock for so long until you know you start to have huge pent up demand. So the point being, those homes that will not be sold in the second quarter, the third quarter, the fourth quarter of this year um, will be sold in the first quarter and the second quarter of next year. So even though we would expect to see the financial results for Lennar um, be weak um, over the next couple of quarters, we're not concerned. Just as when you see some eye-popping numbers from them in the first quarter and second quarter of next year, um, we're not going to be overly excited. We understand that those are things that, that are going to continue on. Yeah. So for companies like that, you would typically hold it through the dip uh, we, in, in the knowledge that it's going to come back. Correct. Yeah. Unless we feel that there is something that um, has materially affected the long-term prospects or what we call catalysts. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we do um, our uh, work on a business, we identify what we call investment catalysts. So there's you know, kind of three tenets to our, our in investment process. Find a good business that we think has a competitive advantage, um, buy it when we believe it's inexpensive, um, and at the same time where we can identify an investment catalyst that we don't believe is well understood by the general marketplace. Okay. So if we identify these catalysts for a business, and as long as those are intact, we're comfortable holding on. Because again, if the short-term dynamics of the market is going to go up, it's going to go down. If, if one tries to um, be reactionary to those types of things, you're destined to fail. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, reflecting on 2008 when we came through the, the dip then, and I know this is a different yeah. scenario, but um, in terms of the investment funds, there was, there was strong inflows throughout the period through St. James's Place into funds. Have you yeah. been finding that through this last period or how's the fund been in terms of inflows and outflows? Yes, um, uh, absolutely. We're, we're continuing to see very strong inflows into the fund. I get a report daily of, uh, of funds and it, it runs a million, two million, three million pounds a day yeah. um, in, into the fund. And, yeah. and that is very consistent with um, the way that it has been prior to the pandemic. That's great. I, I guess as a fund manager, that gives you a lot of comfort that you can continue investing through the dip. Um, so buying at low prices and so on. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. And, and that, that is also part of our, our investment philosophy is if we hold 40 companies in the portfolio, 
you know, we ask ourselves the question every day, um, would I buy this company today? Just because you hold it, you have to reaffirm that for new money that's coming in. So those new investors in the SJP, they're going to be invested in the same companies that an investor who's been in there for years. So we need to treat them the same as those that have been in there for years. If we wouldn't buy a company today, then we will sell it. Okay. And uh, have you sold anything through the dip? We have. Um, we've, we've sold um, a couple of businesses. Um, but I, I want to stress that this was not uh, a reaction to the market disconnect in, in any way. It was a, a natural progression of our workflow. So when, when we are um, analyzing a business, for the most part, it takes months. I mean, it's not something that we just look at a company and two weeks later, we're, we're ready to buy it. It, it takes quite some time. Um, we want to meet with the management teams. We want to get to know them. Um, we oftentimes, if it's a manufacturing company, we'll go visit the plants, you know, ride on buses and go with middle-level management teams to, to really get to know what, what they're doing and, and um, identifying what I mentioned as that competitive advantage that, that we think the company has. So it takes some time. So there's a workflow that, that, that is happening. Now, you know, I will say in a couple of instances, the companies that we wanted to buy because their stock price came down and we had done the work on them, we, we um, uh, had taken that opportunity uh, to move maybe a little faster than we would have um, in the past, just taking advantage of that opportunity. Um, but we have a discipline that it's, it's almost a one in one out kind of a thing. You know, we have 41 companies in the portfolio. If we're gonna buy one, that means one's gotta go, right? Okay. Um, and, and there were um, a, a couple of companies that uh, we sold, one being Home Depot. Mm -hmm. So we, we had owned Home Depot for a number of years. Yep. Uh, the, the stock had more than tripled uh, for us. Uh, the, the, one of the main investment catalysts that we had for the business was their success in garnering a larger market share with the professional customers, so contractors, those that do this for a living. Yeah. Um, they, they created uh, separate uh, desks for them, cards that they can monitor what they're buying and such. We're very successful um, uh, in, in really building loyalty in that market. Um, our expectation was that's been pretty well played out. Their competitors understand that. They were late to the game, but now they're starting to catch up. So given the fact that that investment catalyst has pretty much played out, we went ahead and, and sold that one. Um, the other one that we sold uh, was a company called uh, PPG Industries. So uh, PPG stands for P Pittsburgh Plate Glass. The company's been around for 150 years. And as its name suggests, they were in business to make plate glass. Well, they don't do that anymore. They've really transitioned their business from a specialty chemical business to um, one that is exclusively uh, in the market to manufacture and distribute coatings. Sorry, I missed that. The, the... Coatings, coatings for your car, paint. All right, yeah, yeah. For your car, for your buildings, architectural coatings, things like that. And, and one of our initial catalysts was as that industry was consolidating, as consolidating industries tend to do, um, the profitability of those consolidating um, tends to increase. And as PPG was moving towards a pure play coatings business, that we expected to see the profitability of their underlying businesses um, uh, improve. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't happen. It didn't happen for a variety of reasons, uh, but that as an investment catalyst was something that we monitored very closely. And when we saw that that was not happening, we went ahead and sold um, uh, the business. Yeah. Uh, with the proceeds, we bought two other companies. We bought a company called Xylem, which is a, a water distribution and uh, mitigation company. So anything that has to do with delivering water to, to municipalities, to businesses, um, to residences, uh, Xylem does that. And the other one that we bought was um, a company called Ilanco, uh, which is a, an animal healthcare company. Okay. Uh, that, that produces 
um, products that um, are designed for both the feedstock and for our pets. So as their pet care division is continuing to grow, um, it, it, uh, it looked like uh, a very, very well-run profitable business. So we added that to the portfolio. Is that so people can feed their pets automatically from their iPhone? Like, uh... <laughs> no, that's a different company. <laughs> um, but uh, the interesting thing about, um, a, a com they call it companion care. Companion care, health care for, for your pets is, is very different than um, the pharmaceutical industry, both in Europe and in the States. And that is, um, most of us don't have insurance for our pets. So when mm -hmm. we take the pet to the veterinarian and they need uh, something, uh, you pay for it right there. Yep. There's no third party, there's no, no, no in between. You're buying the product directly from the veterinarian, who by the way, is marking it up about 100% from what they bought it from either Zoetis or Elanco or whatever. So it's a profitable business for them too. Uh, but it's much easier for a company like Elanco to bring a compound to market because there, there are less restrictions for uh, a, a compound that is going to be designed um, for an animal than for a human. Yeah. Uh, so it's much more profitable. It's a great business. Um, our, our pets are living longer now than they ever like have humans. before. No, no, this is, this is true. I mean, a, a lot of the same um, phenomenon that we see in humans are also taking place with, with our pets, with our companion animals. They're, they're living longer. Um, you, you, you tend to spend the vast majority of your healthcare dollar in the last six months of their lives. That's just the, the function of that. And they are also um, succumbing to some of the same self-imposed um, uh, self, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, issues that humans are. Our pets yeah. are now uh, having an obesity problem, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and all of the problems that go along with obesity, you know, which is you know, yeah. diabetes and heart disease and everything, our pets are suffering from the same type of thing. So, you know, um, whenever, whenever I meet a fund manager, it's, it's always fascinating that the investment decisions come back to real basic human just trends. So as you say, yes you know, the acceleration of the move to online working just right. accelerates the growth of these companies. But, does. you know, people's affections for their pets drive an investment right. decision for you guys. And that is also, and this is not the reason why, why we bought it, but, but the acquisition of pets through this pandemic has gone through the roof, right? Yeah. Everyone's been staying at home and not being able to have contact with their friends or whatever, so they've gone out and gotten a pet. Yeah. Well, our, our law firm are hoping for lots of divorces as well, because that... that <laughs> um, oh, Allie, that's terrible. <laughs> so the... Um, looking at the last six months and looking forward, um, I think a lot of what you're saying is actually demonstrating the need to have stock picking as at the forefront of your management style. Um, right those people tracking the market have ridden just the worst roller coaster of a ride. Um, and I guess in America, it's the same as here. These funds are really cheap. They track the market, but what, what we get from someone like you is quality. Um, you're seeing trends before they happen, if you like, and, and being able to identify. So what, what's your thoughts on that sort of, moving forward, because actually trackers have done brilliantly for the last 10 years. Sure. You know? So do you have any particular feelings on that in terms of? Yeah, well, that's, that's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If, if, you've, if you've had um, a protracted bull market, which we've had for the last 10 years. So this, the stock market you know, from 2009 on um, has, has been kind of above trend line. So you've seen pretty good returns. And when you see pretty good returns over that period of time, the, the, the trackers, as you call them, um, that is a, a market environment where they're going to excel. Yep. Now, the, the, the area where they won't excel is when you get into difficult times for a long period of time. Because if you get into a bear market, 
um, you've got the bear market. That's the design of a tracker. If the S&P or the Russell 1000 is down, you know, in the case of the Russell 1000 year to date, it's down 17.7%. Yeah. Um, if you're in a tracker for the Russell 1000, you're down 17.7%. Yeah. And that's just the design. Whereas the North American fund is down 9.7 over that same time yeah. period. So the only way that you can withstand difficult markets is to be actively invested with individuals. And I think SJP has done a great job of this, um, not just with us, but with others in identifying uh, uh, firms that do a very good job at that. Yeah. How, how much pressure do SJP exert on, on you guys, for example, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly? What, what's the interaction like between? Um, uh, it's extensive. <laughs> we, spend, we spend a lot of time talking not just to, to SJP, but um, to Stanford Associates as well. Mm -hmm. So they have an external monitoring team at Stanford, then they have an internal monitoring team at SJP. And and when I first started um, back in 2004 with SJP, they had no internal uh, monitoring team. It was all Stanford. And yep. so now they've built out that capability. Um, it's become relatively uh, robust. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time uh, talking uh, to, to both sides of that. And, and I think it's helpful, not just for SJP, but for us as well, because there are going to be periods of time in, at, at some point in the future where our performance isn't as good as it is now. For whatever reason, you know, there's gonna be you know, a period of time where the catalysts that we've identified for a business, they, they don't come to fruition in a straight line. And it can be lumpy at times and we can go a period of you know, a quarter or two quarters or a year where we don't look very smart. Uh, but if we're able to uh, communicate with both SJP and Stanford to the extent that they understand when we will do well and when we will not do well, it helps us all kind of get through the difficult times um, uh, and, and do less celebrating during the, the, the great times, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, no, that's great. Thank, thanks, Jim. Um, I guess the, the big question on everyone's lips is where do we go from here? You, you guys have got the election looming as well. Um, it, it, it's a real period of uncertainty and, and clients lean on us as the financial advisors and therefore you as the fund managers to kind of guide them through that. Um, and, and it would be good to get your thoughts A on the election and B on where we go from here if that's okay. Pick your brains. Yes. It's, it's interesting that you asked that question because I was uh, just asked yesterday um, to write a piece uh, for SJP that is going to be in their, I guess, the latest quarterly um, update that, uh, that they distribute to partners and, and, and clients as well about that very subject. Um, you know, we have an election in the U.S., um, does, does it matter who wins? What is predictive of future stock market returns? Um, and, and the answer to that question is it is not. Um, there, uh, you know, going back to the, the, the founding of the US and, and the, the, the founding fathers in building this system that we have, um, it is for better or worse designed to get very little accomplished. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I know that sounds flippant, but just the way that it's designed, the more extreme policies uh, that are espoused by politicians on the campaign trail to feed red meat to their base are extremely unlikely to ever become law. Okay. okay. And that's just the way our system is designed. So everything that we hear right now coming from both sides, and we want to do this, we want to raise taxes, we want to lower taxes, all of that is very unlikely to ever become law. So if you look over long periods of time, and by the way, you know, both of the major candidates are, are out there saying, well, if my opponent wins, the stock market's going to tank. Yep. Um, since they're both saying that, they both can't be right. Um, <laughs> Statistically, there is no statistical correlation 
in future stock market returns, depending upon which party is in power in the White House. Okay. Right? There just is none. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that it's not going to create some volatility in the short run. Of, of course it will. People are going to be out there saying crazy things, but you know, the likelihood of those becoming implemented are uh, nil. Yeah. So the second part of your question is, okay, we've taken care of the election. We're not going to concern ourselves with that. Um, you know, what's going to happen to the U.S. economy over the next six months or the next 12 months? Um, uh, that is anybody's guess. Um, uh, it, and it's certainly going to be data dependent. I think we're, we are now in a very different situation than we were in 2008, where, you know, we had a financial crisis. Um, a real estate crisis and a recession happening all at the same time. We kind of can put our arms around that and go, all right, we know how to fix that. Um, over some period of time, we'll, we will get that fixed. Um, yeah. What's happening now um, is unanalyzable. We don't know when there's going to be a vaccine, when there's going to be therapies um, um, uh, to, to mitigate the, the uh, damages that are caused by COVID, how long that's going to take, when we're going to be you know, off of lockdown where we can get back to some degree of normalcy, whatever that is, um, that's going to be the driver to what we see going forward. And we've already seen it in the marketplace. It's if there's good news that comes out that says, okay, there's now a vaccine that's in phase two trialing. It may be here, Dr. Fauci said, certainly by the first part of 2021. Yep. Um, that's great news. The market's going to go up. And then you get COVID cases in Texas double and the market goes down. That's just what we're going to have to live with. But it's not going to affect these long-term business trends that we talked about. You know, and, and, and we can talk about those in, in greater detail if you want to. But the U.S., in our opinion, uh, and North America in general, is advantaged in some, some very fundamental ways that are uh, generational. Okay. Uh, and that uh, th those economies... Um, and, and markets should do well, and again, not every quarter, not every year, but for, for generations. What markets are you talking about there then? What, what's your thoughts on well, that? The US, the US market in general. I mm -hmm. mean, if, if, if you look in, in what I said earlier is I, I would harken back to is that the market's gonna be driven by the underlying fundamentals of the businesses that make that market up. Um, and there's some reasons to believe that uh, those businesses are advantaged. Um, you know, the U.S., although the demographics aren't uh, stellar, uh, in the developed world, our demographics are better than just about anybody else. I mean, yeah. aging of the populations and such in the, in the U.S., it's, it's much better than, than anywhere else in the developed world. And we have a seemingly unending um, supply of very cheap energy in the U.S. that mm -hmm. um, should help at least keep some manufacturing uh, jobs here. So from a consumer spending standpoint, because the demographics are good, endless supply of energy, the, the population trends are, are still very positive. Um, the, the, the U.S. economy is advantaged in some very fundamental structural ways. Yeah. I mean, we've seen that from a St. James's Place portfolio perspective, the um, big shift from, you know, 40, 45% of the equity holdings being in the UK to that being reduced right down to sort of 10, 15%. Right. And, and North America being the sort of predominant holding. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's wise. If you look at most global funds that, that want to try to, to replicate the, um, uh, the economies of the world, that's kind of the design of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's great. And um just conscious of time, Jim, so, uh, you know, th there's no questions coming in there, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to fire them in. But um, I think from what you're saying, I mean, uh, we get clients asking us all the time, what's going to happen next? <laughs> um, we, 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 we have to sort of acknowledge that there's going to be volatility, right? an extreme volatility. I mean, you know, down 3% one day, up 3% the next that sort of thing. Yep. Um, the, the last time I was in um, the UK, um, I, I did a talk for partners. And I don't know if you were there, but um, the, the, the title of my talk was, It's Always Something. And this was before the pandemic. 
Yeah. And I, I put out a list of things that um, we have been faced with, you know, over the last decade. Uh, and in there, I did have SARS and MERS and, and things like that. Y2K, that's more than 10 years ago, but, uh, yeah. um, you know, the Fukushima disaster. It's always something. Mm -hmm. And the next thing that we're going to have to worry about um, is something that you or I or anybody else that's on this call right now is not even thinking about. Yeah. It'll be something new and interesting that we'll have to deal with. But the, the bottom line is, there's always something. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the unpredictable nature of the investing, isn't it? Um, but I, I guess America, the UK, the world, we're set for low interest rates, aren't we? For quite some for time. For some time, for some and, time. And, and stock markets then provide that opportunity for growth. Um, and, and I think St. James' Place as well, we're, we're a long-term investor. You know, we, we want, we look forward we want to manage money for periods in excess of five years. So we're not in it for a fast buck. Right, yeah. And, and I think that's wise. If uh, um, if your time horizon isn't three to five years, then then you shouldn't be doing it. Because no, absolutely. We just, we just can't predict what's going to happen in the short run. But, you know, e even though I said there's always something, if you look at the returns over the last 10 and 20 years in the U.S. market, they've been pretty robust, even, even through some very difficult times yeah uh now the thing is you you actually admitted to me that you you watch your own portfolio every single day no i don't yeah you do <laughs> <laughs> so that that's, well, that's not only that that was told in confidence <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's that that's the tricky bit when you actually put yourself in investor shoes right uh, you know, you, you you live and breathe the the ups and downs, don't you? You do. Yeah. You, 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 you just can't get away from it. Yeah. But you you have to look at it like this though. Is you can't let it affect your judgment. Yeah. How do you, how do you separate the emotion then from from those decisions? From from looking at the portfolio more than I should. Yeah. I, I think the comfort level that you get by doing very deep dive fundamental research in businesses and understanding that you know they're. They're, they're going to do well, not in a straight line, but, you know, over a long period of time. And as long as you have that comfort level, if the stock is down five or six or seven or 10%, um, it's like kind of, so what? It just yeah. is what it is. Yeah. And if you have the conviction, just keep buying. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, um, that's been a great 40 minutes. I, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, oh, it's been my pleasure. Uh, I know you've given up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll let you get on with the rest of your day, Jim. And um, I, I appreciate you joining us here in the UK. Thank you. And I look forward to getting back there again soon. Yeah, we'll definitely do get some golf in, hopefully. Um, and, and thanks for everyone to join us today as well. We had a good few people on, on the call. Um, so it was, it was great to have everyone joining us. Um, and we can let them all. We've got rare sunshine in Scotland today. So uh, awesome. yeah, we can let get everyone outside. go and enjoy the sunshine. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, have a good you. day. Yeah, have a good one. See you soon.